how do we connect the unconnected? How do we bridge the digital divide? How do we make sure every school and every human and every child has access to the internet? And we'll talk about why that's important. So I'll give you a little overview of my journey. Uh, so OneWeb is, what well, we're going to we're gonna talk about two fundamental things, which is OneWeb and the satellite system, and also a measuring mechanism to measure the connectivity of every school. So a little on the, a bit on the journey. In 1990, late 1990s, I built a semiconductor company. It was really interesting. We built a lot of cool stuff, but it wasn't that meaningful. And after selling that company, I decided that anything I did from then on had to have meaning, had to impact people's lives. And I ended up after that going to Africa to try to figure out how to help. I had no idea what to do, but I went there and started connecting schools, literally. It got so exciting as we connected the schools and you connected the kids and you gave them internet access, started running fiber, then built the first fiber to the home in Africa, and then built the first 3G network in Africa. And this was a lot of fun because you could see the impact it had on every child's life. When they touched the computer, when they started to look at the world and see what was going on outside of their communities, they became much more educated, much more innovative, and much more in empowered to change their, their community's life and their life. After building the networks on the ground, I realized that a lot of countries around the world didn't have access, they didn't have backhaul. And so I started a company called O3B Networks, which stands for the other three billion. And we raised a billion and a half dollars and built 12 satellites that, that today are running. There's about 20 of them up today. And it's the world's fastest satellites ever built. And those provide backhaul to a lot of telecom operators around the world. So this is all the history into the problem and to how we're gonna solve it today. So the digital divide, you've seen this map. Most of these countries, are, have disease issues, they have uh, poverty issues, they have malnutrition issues, the whole list of things. And so we want to get into those countries and make sure every one of their schools are connected. Now unfortunately, Africa suffers the most in all of this, but you can see across Asia, Pacific, and even the Arab states, there's a huge gap in the availability of internet access for the kids and for the schools. So how do we get internet to everybody? And the answer is, we're gonna build a satellite system, or we are building a satellite system, that will provide global coverage and very high speed throughput. But we're building a satellite constellation of 1,980 satellites. And these satellites will provide global coverage, very high speed throughput, to a very small antenna that you can put on every school of the world that's not connected. Now why do we want to connect? Because it gives the communities economic opportunity. Because it provides gender equality, because most of the women in the world, most of the offline people are women. And it creates, it's useful for telemedicine, for healthier communities. And of course, the most, not the most important, but the one we're focused on right now and talking about is improving education. Because if we can get the kids better educated and allow the teachers to have more resources, it solves a lot of problems for the future. So here's how we're doing it. We're building this constellation of satellites we have the global KU coverage for this. It's about three and a half gigahertz of spectrum. And those satellites will provide service directly down to the schools themselves. They'll also provide them to many other areas uh, and, and industries like aviation and, and land mobility services. So we built the satellite system and we are actually gonna be launching this in the next couple of weeks. So it's an exciting time. We've been at this for about five years. And these are low Earth orbit satellites, they're close to the Earth. And let me show you what the difference is between a low Earth orbit satellite and a geo satellite. So this is a geo satellite. These are more typical satellites that are out around the Earth. And they have a very, what's called high latency. Meaning when you press the button to click, it takes a long time to get the services back and forth. And so in this example, you can see OneWeb's new LEO system and how long it takes for the, for the signal to travel back and forth. Now the signals are all traveling the speed of light. So they all go the same speed, but they go different distances. If you go to O3B, you can see how long it takes to get to O3B. And when you go to the geosatellites, traveling at the same speed, you end up with a lot more latency. When you click, you have to wait. And this is the challenge of geosatellites. They have a lot of great features, but latency isn't one of them. And so we want to solve that problem so all the children who are using these services could experience all of the web and, and, and dynamic HTML and capabilities that we, and interactive capabilities that we all live on here today. So what, how does it work at a fundamental level? You have a school that's not connected, maybe a remote community. 
we put a gateway in that talks up to the satellite and sends it down to the remote community. Very simple. Now simple, but also about $5 billion. So we had to build a whole bunch of satellites, which I'm gonna talk about, and we had to revolutionize how satellites were manufactured. Nobody built satellites with the quality, speed, and efficiency that we needed, and no one built them at the price points that we needed. And this is showing the constellation and the global coverage. And once this constellation is done of the 1980 satellites, we're adding another constellation around it to give us even more capacity as the need and demand grows in all the communities that we're servicing. So this is a, a long run of system building, but a lot of capacity that we're bringing to the world. So how do we get this capacity up there? Well, we had to invent and create a whole new breed of satellites, something never been, has never been done. These satellites were $50 million each before, and we need to get them under a million dollars. So to do that, we had to invent a bunch of technology, and then we had to build a couple of factories. And so we had to pioneer serial satellite production. So we have the world's first satellite production facility that's actually manufacturing satellites like you would automobiles. So this, these satellites we're building, it's like the Model T. It's the first ones ever coming off the line. They've already, we've built 10 of them so far, and we're starting production in the factories now for, to, to launch about 150 of them this year. And so at this rate, we'll have a, several, uh, a couple thousand up um, in the next three years. So as I said, we're launching in, uh, very soon. So February 26th is when we're launching, which is just two weeks from now. We, uh, uh, we're launching from French Guiana on the Soyuz rocket. We're the world's largest launch purchaser. So we bought 21 rockets. And we've got them scheduled to start launching in September every 21 days. Now you'll notice on the, on the rocket, you'll see the first logo. So first is for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, about a million kids who build robots and robot competitions, which are gonna be the world's nationals of that will be here next year where 200 countries come here to compete. So we're recognizing first in what they do and because this year is their year of inspiration for space. So we're helping take first into orbit. It's an incredible organization founded by Dean Kamen and, and sponsored here in the UAE as well. So we'll talk a little bit now about the terminals about all the satellite stuff is really interesting, but how do you use it? One of the key features of this satellite system is that the satellites are almost always directly overhead. So if you have a terminal and you put it on your school, it can talk straight up to the satellite. And this is a problem because most satellites are off at an angle. And when you put it on the school, the, this, the, the beam hits a tree or a mountain. So it's been very important that we design a system which keeps the satellites directly overhead. So we've, used a, a, we've done a lot of our own imagining of how to build a system where the terminals are easy to install, where a, a child can install it themselves, for instance. So how can they just put something together and put it on with no tools? How can they bring 100 megabits or 500 megabits per second of connectivity to their school, to their own community, with no education, no background, and no training? And this is, these are the types of systems that we're trying to build now and design so, people, so they can be de uh, deployed in massive scale. So we've talked about the schools, and we talked about what we're doing there. But a system this large, with many, many terabits per second of data, can be used for a lot of things. Obviously, IoT is a hot topic today. But another one, which we all experience, is aviation. So we'll be on a number of aircraft, and we're providing services over the poles and all around the world so that you can get on your plane. When you get on the plane, you'll have the same connectivity that you do at home. Very high speed, very low latency connectivity. And of course, at sea, we'll be hitting, uh, providing services to ships. And then home, schools, and health centers. Cellular backhaul is a big area. So you can just plant something somewhere and provide the backhaul and then have a 5G small cell right there. So if you wanted to find coverage in all the hills and valleys and nooks and crannies, it's very easy to do and it can be solar powered. Literally, you can just put it in the ground. So this is a revolutionary step function change in how we're gonna bring broadband to the world. And of course, in transit connectivity. So we'll do trains and buses and land mobility. So as you drive across Peru, for instance, on a bus, all the citizens who are on those buses will have connectivity while they're on the long, tra on, on, on the long trail. So we're building this system and a, a big mission of ours is to connect the schools. And one of the things that I've done 
In parallel with this and with UNICEF is we've started a project called Project Connect. And Project Connect is to measure all the schools and map all the schools in the world and measure their connectivity. So literally to map the schools and to see live how much connectivity each of those schools have. Some of you may be ministers who are buying connectivity for schools, but then when you go to the school, you find that you don't get what you paid for. Or maybe you have children in school and you, don't, you want to know whether the school your, your children go to has connectivity, especially in emerging markets where connectivity is so sparse and, 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 and poor. So using satellites and AI and data science, we've mapped, and primarily there's a team in UNICEF called UNICEF Ventures has been driving this, has mapped 600,000 schools and then provided metrics now for 120,000 of them. So it looks like this. You can look at a map, you can go to the website, you can double click on it, you can zoom in on a country, and you can see all the schools in that country. And you can instantly determine how, how well is that country doing in providing connectivity to their schools. The red is bad, the yellow is pretty bad, and the green is good. So if you look in Colombia, you can see that children in Colombia are suffering. And these are, gonna, these are live, actual connectivity maps. So you can see right now what it looks like. For instance, in Mauritania, you can see how many schools are connected, how many aren't. And then once you see how many schools are connected, you can use that for a lot of other things, like figuring out disease vectors and poverty and where you need to bring new banking systems. Right? This is a great map of, for, for lots of uses. This database is very important beyond just the connectivity for the schools and holding ISPs, including OneWeb, when it provides services, accountable for the services it says it's going to provide. So Sierra Leone, for instance, has just joined on and providing a map, we've mapped the schools and you can see the challenges that we have in Sierra Leone. And this gives all of us who are lucky and fortunate enough to have all the resources that we have to think about how can we help that country? How can we help make all those schools green? Kyrgyzstan is mapped and Kyrgyzstan is using it within their own government to determine which schools are connected and which ones aren't and to hold the ISPs accountable. So a number of countries are already mapped, Mauritania, Colombia, Brazil, Kyrgyzstan, and Rwanda's come on and they're gonna be mapped very soon in Mexico as well as Kenya. So a lot of countries are starting to join on to this and we'll be able to look at one map of the world and you can see which countries have connectivity and which countries don't. And you can see the scale of the problem and the challenges we're facing as a community to bring services to these people. So Project Connect, again, it's a, it's a nonprofit. It's driven by UNICEF. And for governments, they can work with it, international organizations. And of course, companies can, can work together. So walked through OneWeb very quickly and told you a little bit about what we're doing. We're building the system. You can watch it launch live at oneweb.world. It'll be the world's first broadband, production broadband satellites. Once we launch, it'll be the world's first system that's been built on a, with a full supply chain, manufactured in volume. We can build five, 15 satellites per week in our two factories, one in Toulouse, France, and one in Florida. And so, well, thank you very much.